thank you uh, very much, Dee, for asking me to do this webinar. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. I'm really looking forward to the discussion sections when we'll pause and take uh, comments and questions. Um, here's the agenda for the webinar. First, I'm going to start out with a little background information about the German ideology, the book that we're looking at tonight. And then I'm going to have some more detailed information about the context um, which is the state of German philosophy when the work was written. We're going to talk mainly about Hegel and Feuerbach. And then I'll, come, I'll get to a few of the major ideas and analyses that Marx and Engels undertake here. But I want to, want to have one caveat that it's not a comprehensive look at the German ideology. There isn't time in, in a, a short webinar to, to talk about everything in this text. So one thing we have to keep in mind is this is early Marx. Um, some of the concepts that start out here are actually uh, developed much more deeply in later works. The German ideology was written by Marx and Engels between 1845 and 1846, and it's a collection of criticisms of the philosophical perspectives of the times. We usually read just part one of the German ideology, which concerns itself with a critique of Feuerbach. And uh, the International Publishers Edition has selections from other parts, which are also useful. Um, what I find um, important and great about the German ideology is the way Marx and Engels analyze the origin of ideas and uh, offer their critique of the philosophy of idealism. I like the way, also important, is the way they analyze the path of history that has brought humanity to its current place. Um, I uh, can appreciate the author's concern for human emancipation, and I love to read their withering criticism uh, with which they send up their uh, contemporaries in a very kind of John Oliver-esque sarcasm, um, which is very biting. But first we'll turn to the philosophical context. And this is a this book, The German Ideology, is a critique of the, the contemporary philosophers. And contemporary uh, philosophers for this period, it was still dominated by the extremely influential Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Um, Hegel was born about 48 years before Marx, so his career was well underway. He was a very famous man before Marx was born. Hegel taught at the University of Berlin. He was very popular there. He offered a sort of evolutionary theory of the world in idealistic terms. Um, at first, here's the way it goes. At first, uh, people are endowed with just the ability to sense the world around them. And so they could understand things like the sight, smell, and feel of the social and physical world. Later, people develop the ability to be conscious of and to understand themselves. And with this self-knowledge and self-understanding for Hegel, people began to understand that they could be more than what they are uh, were at the current time. So this sets up for Hegel a dialectical contradiction between what people are and what people felt that they could be. And the resolution of this contradiction lies in the development of an individual's awareness of his or her place in the larger spirit of society, the Geist. So in, for Hegel, individuals come to understand, um, come to realize that their ultimate fulfillment lies in the development and the expansion of the spirit of society as a whole. So they start out with an understanding of things, they move on to an understanding of self, and then to an understanding of their own place in the larger scheme of things. Um, so in other words, all development for Hegel takes place in the realm of ideas. Um, you've probably heard it said that Marx turns Hegel on his head. And the idea that history takes place in the material world and not in the world of ideas 
is one of those places where Marx turns Hegel on his head. Another reversal of Hegel is in the relationship between civil society and the state. For Hegel, the spirit represents universal interests, while civil society, the economic realm, um, is uh, comprised of individuals pursuing their own selfish individual interests. The state is, for Hegel, where people can realize their true freedom in a synthesis of universal and particular interests. For Hegel, the state, and he was talking about the Prussian state at the time, represented, quote, the rule of reason in society, the incarnation of freedom. Um, so we'll see, of course, Marx sees civil society as paramount in importance and certainly has a different view of the state than Hegel does. Um, one of the reasons I love teaching my students about the German ideology is uh, because it gives me the opportunity to talk about Ludwig Feuerbach and his critique, his materialist critique of Christianity. Feuerbach was born 14 years before Marx, so he was in the upper level of that um, generation. And he was one of a group of philosophers who were known as the Young Hegelians. And they were influenced by, but critical of, Hegel. Feuerbach argued that we should move away from Hegel's emphasis on consciousness and the spirit of society, and instead focus not on ideas, but on material reality of human beings. In his book, The Essence of Christianity, uh, Feuerbach says that what people say about God is a mystification of what they know about themselves and their fellow human beings. People take all that is worthy and good about themselves and other people, and they project all of that onto a man-made God. And this creates a God who is perfect, almighty, and all-knowing. And in contrast, people then see themselves and their fellow human beings as imperfect, defective, powerless, and sinful. Um, this uh, religion diverts all of humanity's energy of love into, uh, 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 onto the love, energy of love goes to God, and it makes harmony on earth impossible. Feuerbach argued that this kind of religion must be overcome and that its defeat could be aided by a materialist philosophy in which people take uh, become their own highest object, an end in themselves. So you can see it's a very humanist perspective, a very materialist perspective, and a very critical uh, perspective. Um, and I like to tell my students about this, and I tell them I'm reminded of Feuerbach when I see uh, posts on Facebook um, that in which people thank God for achievements uh, like, say, their graduation from law school or their overcoming an illness, when these achievements really are the result of the work and, and triumph of real human beings, like themselves and their teachers and their healthcare workers, but they're not giving these people any credit. Instead, all of that good is projected onto God. So Marx um, applauds Feuerbach's materialist critique of Hegel, but Feuerbach only focuses on religion, and Marx believed that the entire social world, especially the economy, has to be subjected to a materialist analysis. Marx and Engels open the German ideology with a blistering critique of the, quote, revolution, unquote, in German philosophy. In contrast to France, where real revolutionary activity was occurring, in Germany, the revolution was taking place in the realm of pure thought. As Marx and Engels say in the preface to the German ideology, this dreamy life of illusions causes real suffering in the real material world. And the German philosophers who see themselves as dangerous wolves are really just bleating middle-class sheep. Uh, quote, the phantoms of their brains have got out of their hands, unquote, 
and seem to have taken on a life of their own. As Marx says in one of the 11 theses on Feuerbach, philosophers have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. So I have, a, I have some pictures here of Karl Marx. I always like to show the young Karl Marx when I uh, teach my students about Karl Marx because he is about their age in that, in that picture. Um, the first major achievement of the text that I'd like to highlight, and then we'll pause for discussion, is the critique of idealism. Part of that critique is to look at ideas themselves, that is mental labor. Uh, from a materialist standpoint. For Marx and Engels, consciousness itself arises from the way humans produce their material life. The division of labor into physical labor and mental labor is one of the first circumstances that sets up associations of humans against each other. And this is part of their analysis of history, which I'd like to address after, um, after the break. But first, um, we have to think about where ideas um, come from, and we'll turn back to civil society, the question of civil society. Um, you, uh, I mentioned earlier that Marx and Engels cri criticize Hegel's view of civil society. Civil society is defined by Marx and Engels as, quote, the whole commercial and industrial life of a definite stage of the development of productive forces. Instead of the state, civil society is the true source and theater of all history. Inwardly, the civil society organizes the state, and outwardly, it takes on relationships with other nations. Instead of the state predominating over civil society, as Hegel says, Civil society is the basis of the state and all of the rest of the idealistic superstructure. It leads to, uh, quote, theoretical, all theoretical products and forms of consciousness, religion, philosophy, ethics. This confusion over the, the place of civil society in history has led to very distorted views of history. For example, where later history is made the goal of earlier history. Historians ignore relationships of human, the relationship of humans with nature, and they recognize only political actions and theoretical, that is, religious struggles. Historians share the, share the illusions of their times, and they believe what people say about themselves. Marx and Engels write, uh, whilst in ordinary life every shopkeeper is very well able to distinguish between what somebody professes to be and what he really is, our historians have, yet, have not yet won even this trivial insight. They take every epoch at its word and believe everything that it says and imagines itself about itself to be true. An example of, of historians taking people at their word um, reminds me of an insight from another of Marx's works, and that is the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon. Um, he's talking there about events of European history that I had been taught in high school and college, and the motivation there was always said to be religious. These were the great Catholic versus Protestant struggles in, um, in European history. Uh, in Marx's account, all the parties in the, in the situation with Louis Bonaparte, um, were, uh, they were a complex set of protagonists, um, and they're mo all motivated by their positions in the real material world of production, ownership, and class relations. And then in a footnote deep into the book, Marx mentions, by the way, that the Orleanists were Catholic and the Bourbons were Protestant, as if it was an afterthought, and it was an afterthought for Marx. So where do these illusions of any age um, come from? Uh, they are the ideas of the ruling class. The ruling, that is, the ruling material force of society is also its ruling intellectual force. It has control not only over the means of production, but over the means of mental production. 
and it can produce ideas that are the ideal expression of its dominance. Marx says that each ruling class has its own little thinking part, and that uh, the job of that thinking part is to perfect the illusions of a class about itself. So when the aristocracy was the ruling class, the concepts of honor and loyalty were dominant, and they seemed like eternal laws. And now with the bourgeoisie in control, concepts like freedom and equality are dominant. But of course, in, in, in industrial capitalism, people are not free. Personal freedom is limited to the individuals who are members of the ruling class. Only in a real community would individuals have the chance to cultivate their gifts in all directions. That is, they would have personal uh, freedom. So let's, um, let's pause there. I'm not sure what time we have, but um, we could stop and, and uh, uh, pause for a minute for questions and comments and any, any ideas about ideas. I have some questions here. Let's see. Um, what are the illusions of, our, of the current age? How do we invent our own historical narratives to reflect ruling class ideas and interests? And what illusions do we labor under today? Um, the second question is, happens to be my own um, research question that I've looked into. Uh, uh, that's something I've, I've, I study um, in Caribbean history, is how historical narratives reflect class ideas and class interests. So if we could open up the, the floor to questions right now um, at this point, and then we could go back and um, uh, take an, on another point. D. OK. Um, if you'd like to make a comment or uh, ask a question, please just click your, your raised hand icon, the picture of the raised hand. Just click it, and we'll be able to open your mic. I'm hoping we'll have some questions. OK, Diane, your mic is open. Hi. I guess what I struggle with a lot is, can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. OK. Hi, Diane. What I, hi. What I struggle with a lot is um, it seems like very basic in a capitalist society is the idea of because you're rich, you're a good person. And everyone strives to be rich and good. And of course, you know, that doesn't, that isn't necessarily true. <laughs> that's, that's true. Well, thank you. That, that's absolutely, that's an interesting point because it's almost like, um, like people uh, under Feuerbach's uh, critique of Christianity, they were, they were projecting goodness onto the divine, and maybe maybe we do project goodness onto people who have a lot of money. I always think of that when I hear about um, how wonderful these philanthropists are for giving away money, and of course they they have all that money because of the exploitation of of labor. Um, so it's it doesn't make them seem so magnanimous then, but. Um, but it's, I think it, it varies. Sometimes we think about rich people as uh, dangerous or, or, or um, money as being uh, the love of money being the root of all evil. evil. There's that strain, I think, in our culture, too. Darren, your mic is open. Darren? Can you hear me OK? Yep. Oh, great. Um, history is written by the, the, the victors, uh, the ruling class, certainly. Uh, case in point, I had a discussion with a fellow co-worker the other day about uh, when is the United States going to be prosecuted for the war crimes at Hiroshima and Nagasaki? And mm -hmm. this person became outraged, a veteran, and uh, the, the, the ruling uh, theme in this whole thing with the uh, atomic bombings was uh, this needed to be done, the end of the war, would there be two million dead if we invaded Japan, and this is all 
Japan was ready to surrender. They just mm -hmm. want to keep the emperor. And the other point I want to make here is, uh, as far as religion, um, I go to a fundamental Baptist church, and I'm probably the only one who had Democrat Party bumper stickers on my car. Mm -hmm. I am known, I said it today to a gentleman, I'm a socialist, I'm not ashamed of it. How is capitalism working out for you? And mm -hmm. uh, religion can be used as a good thing. I'm really into liberation theology, for instance. Or, and it can be for evil. I'm a, re I'm a former Catholic, trust me. I know how evil certain religious institutions have been throughout history. Thank you, Darren. That's that's a really good comment. I I, um, I really agree uh, that that there are a variety of religious ideologies, and I'm, I have to say thank you for continuing to attend that fundamentalist Baptist church, and and engaging people there in conversations. And I'm sure. You'll um, you'll show by your your um, example that um, people can care about pe socialists are, are are human beings that um, can care about the working class or do care about the working class and you you make a really good point about history being written by the victors um, that's definitely um, uh, part of it except. In, uh, well, in the soci this is a different sort of strain, but in the sociology of um, uh, social memory uh, literature, we, we often look at how um, informal or unofficial histories uh, are, are expressed as well. Um, and I, I study Cuban history, and, and that's written by sometimes the victors, but the victors are people who are in um, contention with uh, with imperialism so um, so it's it's there's it's always a little bit more complicated than just uh, history written by the uh, the winners but thanks for your comment Dan your mic is open Dan hello uh, can you hear me okay yep okay um, my question is well as you know socialism is still a very big stigma in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think could possibly be done to get rid of the stigma and get rid of the 60 plus years of propaganda against it? Wow, that's a that's a big question. I wish I had an answer to that. Um, I think well, uh, I. Since I'm I'm presenting a, a, a something on the German ideology right now, I think um, having a, a better sense of our of the history of socialist thought um, and its its uh, the insights that it has had um, over I mean in the last 200 years, in fact, uh, I think that that's one area that I think we could improve. I know um, I, I had children who went through the public school system and I looked at what their history books and their political science or government books said about Karl Marx and of course it was just very distorted and wrong. So I think getting getting the history of ideas straight um, would go far into not demonizing uh, socialism. And I think embracing socialism is, is a great idea just like uh, Darren said. He, he, he's open about being socialist, and I think it's it's hard sometimes because it is there is such a stigma. But I I think the more of us that are open about about being um, socialists, uh, that um, that sort of diffuses the situation. But it's an important question. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. David, your mic is open. David. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Well, first of all, I just wanted to mention um, I'm actually Catholic, and I, well, I follow this idea. Dan, I know you didn't mean it that way, but it's funny, though, because my personal, I guess, the way I see it is my religion is that Catholicism tells me it's not enough just to say that you have, it's faith and works. You can't just have to say you're a part of this and you do it, you actually have to go out and live it, which is a bit different from the Protestant tradition. But I don't want to linger on that. Um, something that I was thinking about because you mentioned history is written by the victors is you may not think of this as a source of an interesting, as a profound thinking, 
But the game, the game Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 has this interesting thing where in one of the cutscenes it says, history is written by the victor, and then he says, history is filled with liars, all you need to change the world is one good lie and a river of blood. And that's kind of what I'm thinking about how, like, the thing, the way that these types of lies have been filtered in is that you can make lot, is that often, a lot of times, the history is changed after the fact, fix the fits the needs, and to basically have only, to basically prop up their own little ruling, st their own little status, basically, and at times it may be consistent, but the history overall is prized over consistent, any consistency between the events, basically. Mm hmm Great. Okay. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. And I, I'm also, I'm an ex-Catholic um, myself, and I, I, I appreciate your pointing out that difference between the Protestant and the Catholic perspective on faith and works. And of course, that's another text that we all read in, in my sociology theory class, and that's the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. Um, but uh, you're right that the Protestant, uh, the, the idea of um, uh, they, they, they do set up a different approach towards uh, life. But I think what uh, Marx would say about Catholics and Protestants is just that, that, um, that uh, it's really the, that, that set of ideas that is Catholicism or the set of ideas that is Protestantism were, um, were adopted by groups of people in society given their position in the production process and in the mode of production, where they stand in the relation to other people in the mode of production. That's what makes a, an idea, a set of ideas compatible and, um, and compelling for a group of people, that it fits with what their economic and social and political interests uh, have. Um, I agree also with histories really varying depending on what is um, who, who is telling the, the story. Um, I, I, I'm not familiar with that um, particular game. I can appreciate games having um, ideas like that in it. I think one big lie reminds me about the second uh, point that I was going to make, uh, I'm, we're going to talk about, about what, um, what causes social change. Um, Marx was very clear that that ideas don't um, don't bring about social change. Um, he said this in other contexts about, um, for instance, uh, capitalism and and environmental degradation. Capitalism just is incapable of um, of applying best practices or or data to um, to uh, their practices. Instead, they just look for short-term uh, profit, and they're incapable of taking a rational and uh, a view or rational approach to environmental um, sustainability. Um, he felt uh, he would he was um, despairing that any amount of education uh, could change uh, that. He felt that it was just the structural conditions of production that were causing that environmental degradation and no ideas were going to change it. So thanks for your thanks for your comments. Gary, your mic is open. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Gary. Okay, yes. What my interest is that in the German ideologies, Marx and I guess Engels seem to make a big deal of the concept of alienation. And, I mean, you know, I read volume one of Capital some time ago, so, you know, maybe, you know, so I can't specifically say that they didn't make a big deal about it. But I don't think Marx so much made a big deal about that particular concept in Capital. So can you comment on, on that about, you know, this, which is a very early statement of their philosophy, and capital, which is a much later statement about philosophy. Okay, okay great. Well, um, I, I, uh, 
I can, I think. Um, I thank you for that that question. In fact, um, I was talking to some people today about the fact that I was going to do this tonight, and they mentioned alienation. And alienation wasn't even one of those concepts that I have really separated out um, to to look at tonight. Um, but uh, I think you're right. The alienation alienation was something that interested the quote early Marx unquote, a little bit more maybe than the later Marx. I was thinking about the economic and philosophical manuscripts of 1844, I think, or 1846. It's something uh, an even earlier work um, than the German ideology, I think, is where he introduces the idea of alienation. And here he does talk about alienation in the, in the sense that um, the product of one's labor, or the product of one's activity, is um, who owns it. So it's a question of ownership and uh, and the the products of our labor. Um, that that is is why he he enters into alienation here. And he does. They do talk uh, later. I have something in the second section about um, about uh, alienation and, and overcoming alienation and how that has to be kind of a worldwide thing. So I think there's a, a few, I remember in my notes I, uh, that I talk about generally, um, or I generally talk about Marx, um, there's a few different ways that he talks about alienation, but, um, but separation from the product of, um, of one's labor is one form of alienation. And then the uh, separation from the the the, um, the productive forces as a whole, seeing seeing uh, societal social structures as alien, even though they are only human structures or human uh, products of humanity, um, they're still experienced by people as alien and enslaving and and uh, other. Um, so I think those are two ways that he uses alienation in, in this work. Uh, but it may be better developed in, in capital. I, I'm not sure I can remember exactly uh, where his biggest discussion of alienation is, but I know it does appear in the very early philosophical manuscripts too. So thanks for that question, Gary. Ken, your mic is open. Ken, your mic is open. Ken, still there? Yes. Can you hear me out there? Yes. Okay. Um, calling through on this, I'd like to ask a question mainly about the religious aspects that you had brought up earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, if you could, could you please outline the types of thinking that is assisting the capitalist, the bourgeoisie, and its continuation of the mysticism throughout the working class that we find going on here? And how do we begin to attack the mysticism to begin to move people towards a more concrete, a more materialist thinking? And thank you. Onward mm -hmm. to socialism. All right. Thank you, Ken. That's really, I, I really am uh, sympathetic with that question because I would also like to see it, and that's why, as I mentioned, I really love to to tell my students about Feuerbach and his criticism of Christianity, um, uh, and and how it 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 takes it projects a a good um, God and a, and contrasts that with a, a sinful humanity, and I think recognizing that humanism and and um, uh, and I agree that capitalism also, the bourgeoisie, uh, benefits from the mysticiza mysticization of our lives and keeping those mystical ideas um, relevant and or, or alive in, in uh, groups of people. So I think it is uh, important. I, I um, as a, a former Catholic, I think the way, the best way to undermine some of that mysticism is by studying world religions and seeing the way other people, um, other groups of people um, embrace different kinds of religious uh, beliefs sometimes does uh, undermine um, 
uh, all of them, because why should our one, you know, uh, European um, Judeo-Christian culture have the one true idea of religion when other groups um, believe as strongly in their own? Um, so I think I think studying world religions and studying humanist uh, values and the value of or or uh, showing the value of those uh, beliefs is one way, and I think you're right that it would help to um, to undermine capitalism ultimately to uh, to to get that mysticism uh, clarified. Thank you, Ken. Anyone else out there? Diane, your mic is open, Diane. Diane? Hi. I don't know Hi. if you're talking to me or not. I, um, I, I hear you. Well, some say that the U.S. has become more socialistic, and I wanted to know in what ways did you do you think we've become more socialistic and what effects that has ha had on, on us? Uh, sure. Well, thank you for the question. I think the United States has not become more socialistic, not since uh, the um, New Deal when it when it passed Social Security and and uh, later uh, the Medicare pro program. I think the Medicare program is a is a more socialist um, approach. It, it it serves as a, a a basis to keep elderly people from um, from uh, becoming impoverished and not being able to take care of their medical uh, needs. So I, I think, um, on the contrary, the United States has become less uh, socialistic, where, um, in fact, in, these, in this current age where um, the Secretary of Education is against public education, instead of public um, schools, um, we hear our government, our current administration, talk about um, government schools rather than public schools. Uh, so public education, even the postal service, um, public, uh, the public correction systems, we're, we're trying to privatize hospitals. Our public um, universities are um, uh, really under, um, uh, under fire in the sense that um, the government and the and, and government public agencies used to cover a great deal of the cost of a, a, an education for uh, working class um, college students. Now, even if you do go to the public universities, the student, the student's parents, and um, and uh, the student and the student's parents are expected to pay. A much much higher proportion of that uh, bill than um, than in previous uh, generations, and of course they don't have the money to do that. They have to borrow that, and that's just enriching um, uh, student uh, banks that um, give student loans. So I, I wish the United States. I wish I could tell you that the United States was becoming more of a socialist state in this way or in that way, but unfortunately, I don't think. I think the trend is going the opposite direction, um, and it just took a big turn for uh, in that opposite direction in the recent election. But that might mean that might um, hopefully will uh, will will have a chance to uh, try to um, turn that around uh, with the political activity that's going on right now. So thanks for that question, Diane. How many more do you want to take? Um, uh, how many do we have on the? Maybe a couple more, and then and then we'll have time afterwards too for. Okay. Yeah, let's do do a couple more. Gary Gary Mueller, your mic is open. Gary Mueller. Hey, Gary. Are you there? Maybe Gary's not there. Uh, Diane, uh, K 
Kay, your mic is open. Diane K, your mic is open. I didn't have another question. I think that was an inadvertent problem there. Okay. Thank you, though. Okay, thank you. Do we have another one? or? We can move on if you'd like. Okay. May as well move on. Okay, okay. Well, we'll have a chance to do um, more questions um, after. And this uh, this next section is is a little bit less, um, a little shorter, I think. But uh, but I really appreciate those questions because we're really branching out into uh, different areas there. So the the second um, major idea that I wanted to uh, talk about from the German ideology is the path of history that has brought humanity to its current place. This is a materialist view of the nature of humans and the circumstances that have led to the development of humanity from the days before written history right through to the Industrial Revolution. And it's based on what Marx knew from his extensive reading of history, anthropology, and philosophy. Marx and Engels say that human history can't be rooted in ideas or dogmas, but instead has to start with the existence of living human individuals who are acting in a definite way in the material conditions in which they find themselves. The way that humans distinguish themselves from other animals is that they produce their means of subsistence. They produce their own subsistence. By producing their means of subsistence, humans are indirectly producing their own actual material life. C.J. Arthur, the, uh, ed in the editor's introduction to the German ideology, calls this the fundamental point of the German ideology. That is, that humans produce themselves through labor. The mode uh, with which they produce shapes their very mode of life, it's an expression of their life. What they are coincides with their production, both with what they produce and with how they produce. And this uh, idea of the mode of production um, is a definite form of activity, a definite form of expressing human life, and a definite mode of life. And we see uh, the beginnings of this uh, idea of the mode of production, which is developed, I think, much further in future works. And that includes not only the forces of production, that is, the tools um, and technology, the cultural development of the weapons, I mean, the tools needed for production, which includes weapons when you think about hunting and gathering societies, farm implements, machines, computers, and the knowledge of how to use them, but also the relationships among people, uh, that the form of production channels human beings into, um, and that is called the relations of production. So the combination of the forces of production and the relations of production comprise the mode of production. And as, as populations increase in this uh, account of human history, uh, the forces of production are developed, <clears throat> excuse me, from basic hunting, gathering, and fishing through horticulture, agriculture, pastoralism, crafts, small-scale industry, and finally industrial production with machines and chemicals. Corresponding to the development of the forces of production are changes in the kinds of property one finds, from tribal property through ancient communal or state ownership to feudal or estate property. At the same time, the division of labor grows more complicated, and along with it the relationships among individuals and society and the way that society as a whole is organized. So Marx and Engels show that at every stage 
there is one direct, at least one directly producing class. And the society is organized so that there's, a, in the sense that it's an association organized against this directly producing class. So, uh, for example, um, when, the, when the forces of production are the minimal hunting, gathering, and fishing of tribal ownership, the division of labor is very elementary, basically echoing the division of labor between the sexes and the family, and between the ages in the family as well. Class relations at this point consist of the patriarchal family and the incipient slavery in the family, which is later expanded to enslave non-family members as well as family members. And then in the ancient communal or state ownership, agriculture, commerce, and crafts are developing, leading to a more developed division of labor, including uh, labor by people in towns set against labor by people in the countryside. And of course, we have here labor of um, physical labor and mental labor as separate. This antagonism between town and country, though, it continues right through industrial capitalism. And that's what sometimes is said to prevent uh, capitalism from uh, handling uh, uh, environmental um, sustainability in a rational way. At the ancient communal level, there's a kind of echelon authority uh, that uh, Marx and Engels describe. They don't use the word echelon, but it's one in which one class of people dominates another class. And that is, for instance, citizens and the enslaved in the uh, city-states of the ancient world. The next form of ownership that they discuss here in detail is feudal or estate property in which the directly producing class is the serfs, with a vast hierarchy of nobility set over and against them. The antagonism between the town and the country is very intense, but in feudal states, the country dominates with a very elaborate hierarchy. And in the towns, there's guilds, um, and the guilds have a relatively flat authority structure. And my next slide is entitled social change, which is a very sociological kind of word that we use. Um, but I, I thought it applied here. We want to talk about how change. Um, Anita? Uh, yes? Your slides are not moving. Oh, you don't have social change on there? No. Oh, I don't know. You have forms of ownership on there? We have questions to ponder and discuss. Really? Oh uh, dear, I've I've gone past that. Um, oh dear. Uh, I don't know. Okay, show. Do you see it now? You see materialist yes. history? Yes. Now? Yes. Okay, that's what I had. To, sorry. Um, Oh dear. Okay, well, um, you can see, I'll just go over these. Materialist analysis of history is um, what I said, that, that instead of um, in the world of ideas, that we have to root history in the existence of living human beings acting in the, in the actual material world, the environment, and the um, mode of production. Um, and humans are producing uh, indirectly their own material life. And then I pointed out that C.J. Atkins said this was the, the key idea from the German ideology, that humans produce themselves through labor. Um, the mode of production, I think, is an important concept. Um, and he, uh, uh, Marx and Engels describe it quite in detail here, that it's a definite form of activity, a form of expressing human life, and a mode of life. And the mode mode of production is the forces of production plus the relations of production comprise um, the uh, uh, specific um, the mode of production. So my materialist interconnections was just looking at how as the forces of production um, evolve, so change 
the relations of production, the division of labor, the forms that property take, and the organization of society as a whole. And they assert that there's always this directly producing class and that the organization of society is a, an association of society against it. Um, my forms of ownership, I, uh, he, he, they go into um, industrial society quite a bit here too, but in this particular section where he's talking about the, um, the history, um, they just look at tribal ownership, ancient communal state ownership, and feudal and estate property. So then I did get to social change. Now, um, the role of ideas here in uh, the materialist view of history is clearly subordinate or non-existent. What drives social change here is when the existing social relations are in contradiction with the existing forces of production. It doesn't matter what ideas or theories are out there in the world, they can't make a difference until the real material conditions of life lead to change. And real liberation, he says, is an historical and not a mental act. Um, okay, so um, how is this division of labor experienced in industrial capitalism? <clears throat> so toward the end of the section that we call that is called materialism and idealism, Marx and Engels describe how the division of labor is experienced. Social power, which is nothing but a multiplied productive force, is experienced, as I pointed out in earlier, as an alien power enslaving individuals. Marx and Engels say that the I thought this was a really interesting insight, that the division of labor and private property are in a way identical expressions, one with reference to activity and the other with reference to the product of that activity. And there's where the alienation comes in. Um, in this uh, section, they say in a communist society, no one would have one exclusive sphere of activity. That's the section where he, he says you can be an, uh, a farmer in the morning and a critic in the afternoon um, in a communist society instead of being channeled into one area. The experience of social forces as alien continues unabated now that human activity has been expanded into world historical activity under which people feel more and more enslaved. Alienation can only be abolished with two premises. First, it becomes intolerable when most of humanity is propertyless um, and when it has produced a contradiction of an existing world of wealth and power. It has to be universal, world historical. Um, empirically, communism is only possible as an act of people, quote, all at once, unquote. And so I want to leave it there again. Um, this, uh, again, I want to say it isn't a comprehensive discussion, um, but if you have other questions and you want to um, bring up any other aspect of the German ideology that interests you in particular, uh, please feel free to um, uh, open this, I mean, to ra hit the raise your hand button when uh, Dee opens it up. And I do have some more questions to ponder and discuss. I wonder, you know, people could think about how has property evolved since the 1840s, um, what the role of the state is now, and do we think that ideas can ever change uh, social relations? I, I think um, I I teach, I'm, I'm involved in the education um, roles in, in uh, society. I, I hope that education can, um, can make a difference, but, um, but Marx seems to be not very um, uh, optimistic uh, that that can happen. And I'll just go on to my last slide. I have a bibliography here. So uh, those of you who are um, listening to this and have access to the, the PowerPoint, I'll, give access, I'll send the PowerPoint to Dee so that she can make that available to you if you want to read more about the German ideology, I would really encourage you 
uh, too. It's a it's a it's a, a really interesting text um, and uh, fun uh, to read in many ways. So I guess we can open up um, and have some last questions and answers if you're ready okay. for that. Benito, your mic is open. Uh, hello. Yes. This is, yeah. You had, Benito, you had a, um, a a statement in the previous slide that I didn't I didn't couldn't understand. Uh, something about something is to activity and something else is to. Yeah. Yeah, could you explain that, repeat it, and explain it? Uh, can you see it now? Whoops. Wait. Uh, it's, it's the reason of why is to activity as private property is to the product of that activity. Right. What he said in particular, in general, oh, wait a minute. Oh, let me find it on my page here. Um, they, I thought that was just really, uh, I'd never thought of it that way, but he said, um, the division of labor and private property are, in a way, identical expressions, one with reference to activity and the other with reference to the product of activity. So property is a way of dividing society as to who owns the product of that activity. That's property. Division of labor is telling who, what, what, who does what in the society. I think it's one way he's saying that all of those, if you let me go back even more, let's see. All these, all these um, are interconnected. The forces of production, the relations, the division of labor, the form of property, and the organization of society all change kind of in uh, in tandem with each other. I think that's what he was getting at. Do, do you have any um, ideas about that, Benito, that you want to um, talk about here? No, I just wanted to understand the, the statement. That's all. I hadn't, I hadn't seen that or, or thought of that. You know, I hadn't really thought of that one. I've, I've taught this book for like 30 years, and I always find new things, and that was kind of a new idea to me uh, recently, too. Thank you for your question. Oh, thank you. Anyone else out there? Diane Franks, your mic is open. Um, I, I think that's me. Um, so if socialism is the first step to communism, as some say, how have the communist countries realized the social uh, or economical structure for the better? For the better? Correct. If, okay. if uh, Marxism does not believe in private property or division of labor, um, how has the, the you know the communist countries utilized that, and what have the uh, results been for the better? Okay, great. Thank you for that question, Diane. I would um, I would answer it in a, a few uh, different ways. First of all, um, I I'm not from, well. What I tell my students um, about Karl Marx and, and Friedrich Engels is that their, I think their, their strongest point was the critical analysis of capitalist society. Um, and I think they were much better at giving us a thorough um, and a, a unique and new um, and uh, really transformative criticism of capitalism than they they weren't as good at giving a blueprint for communist societies. So I don't think the blueprint is there for, um, for exactly what, uh, how society should be. And I think that division of labor quote that I mentioned, and I'll never find it right now, is, is um, instructive here. Because 
it says um, that in a communist society you can be a shepherd in the morning and a farmer in the afternoon and a critic after dinner or something, something to that effect. And people who have had experience with socialist countries know that that's not really uh, true, that there's still a division of labor in a socialist society as well. Um, and as far as the communist countries, I, I'm, I'm really best familiar with, with Cuba, and that is a society where they're striving for a socialism. And I think um, one way uh, that uh, they have made, uh, uh, they have abolished um, private property is um, by uh, having the productive forces of society, the means of production in society, mainly in the hands of the, the, the state as a whole, the people as a whole. And I, I, I do think a, a socialist society like Cuba is successful when the people um, are participating, and they do participate, in um, ownership over, uh, over those productive forces. And um, for example, um, uh, as I understand it, in um, Cuba, a foreign government uh, or a foreign corporation like uh, the Melilla Hotels, for example, or a Spanish um, hotel chain can invest uh, money in uh, Cuba, but Cuba, the people of Cuba own 51% of that enterprise, um, and the foreign investment investor can only own 49%. So a majority of it is always owned by the people as a whole. So they take the benefits of those of those enterprises and plow them right back into the society, keeping a, a floor under which people cannot sink. That is a floor of um, having their health care taken care of, their education paid for, um, and basic needs um, in terms of uh, food, clothing, and shelter taken care of. Um, that's the, the basic needs. And, and the, the um, what would be private profit off of those industries is then instead um, uh, diverted to uh, the good, the common good of the, the uh, people as a whole. So I hope that answers your question. It's a it's a tough question, Diane, but thanks for it. Other questions? Gary, Gary Mueller, your mic is open. You have to click your mic, Gary. Click your mic now. There you go. Okay. Oh, I did it. Hi. So first, I want to thank you so much for teaching this class. Thank you. Um, going back to the... Um, uh, first break, there was a section that's uh, on the pondering questions that said, what are the illusions that we're living under now? Mm -hmm. And it's fascinated me since the most recent election, the, the class of people that seem to have gone out to vote for Donald Trump, um, in a sense they seem to hold uh, an illusion that I've seen on Facebook and heard people say many times, which is not that they are poor people, but that they're just basically um, multi-billionaires themselves who are temporarily embarrassed. And I was wondering if this view from the masses has been common throughout history, or is this something new that's come uh, with the birth and the strengthening of the capitalist society? Uh, Gary, oh, stay on the mic because I'm not sure I understand. Um, Trump voters have the illusion that um, who are the multi-billionaires? Um, I believe they see themselves as instead of working people striving for their own, I think they see themselves as people who are about to become billionaires and this is okay. why they uh, vote against their own common interests. Yes, that's an interesting. Okay, now I understand what you're talking about. They, um, they, they want to make sure that people who earn five hundred thousand dollars a year, um, don't pay too much taxes because who knows? Maybe next year they'll hit the lottery and they don't want to pay taxes then. So, um, so they want to keep the uh, the the um, the, the uh, structures uh, in favor of the rich because they might join the 
ranks of the rich. Uh, that's a um, I'm 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 surprised that uh, that that kind of optimism, that kind of blind optimism, is still a, a, an illusion out there. Um, I don't know. I think they they feel that. Um, maybe that they won't become billionaires or multimillionaires themselves, but they will um, benefit somehow economically from the rich getting as rich as they want, um, which of course is 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 not the way uh, it happens. Um, and I think we do have to strive against that illusion. Um, it, it's true that uh, I think part of this is us in the United States um, having such the ruling ideas are so of uh, the ruling class in our country in particular are so strong that nobody wants to say I'm a worker. Um, instead, they want to say I'm middle class, as if um, there's more fluidity uh, among different classes. Um, but uh, but there isn't that working class consciousness here, which would um, help illuminate people's actual interests. So that's a really that's a really good point, and I think this is an age of illusions and um, with a vengeance. Uh, so I think a lot of um, I mean I think disillusionment or um, is uh, something that we really have to have to pay attention to. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. Wendy, your mic is open. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. And I want to thank you for a great class. And I'm divided about the question of, uh, now I'll lose it entirely. Um, uh, well, I'm excited about the fact that we can't have a, a real transformation until uh, the social forces are opposed to, I think it was the mode of production or something like that. But anyway, the social forces are opposed to the economic situation. Um, because I think that's what the party works on. And I think that's why the party continues to fight for the heart and soul of the Democratic Party. Because the Democratic Party is associated with labor, is associated with women's rights, is associated with um, you know a social agenda. But now that I've used the word agenda, it's reminding me that I sometimes do really think that when our agenda gets gets itself together, and I'll give an example, then we move. And my example is, I think that there was. A, a real inability for people to get together and say Israel has got to stop occupying Palestine and in order for there to be a peace process and I don't see that as a, uh, a, a, a limitation anymore I think that we have got past that in in a sort of a hundredth monkey sort of way I think that people really know that you don't see you know, shouting Zionists, shouting down people who are simply saying Israel is not supporting the peace process. You don't see that anymore. That's my point. So anyway, that's my example of how I really feel like somehow an idea. So so I'm I'm confused in my mind because somehow I think the idea, mm -hmm. the the resolution of the idea, the 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 thesis antithesis synthesis thing has has allowed us to go forward about the Middle East and and yet I also agree that we got to wait until the social forces are opposed to the economic situation okay I'll shut up mm -hmm. oh no thanks thanks so much that really that's a really good example um, and I think you're right it I found it kind of discouraging the thought of um, you know until uh, the relations of production are no longer are, are in in contradiction to the development of the forces of production, uh, nothing moves forward. But I think our party says that that those conditions do exist now. That we, for for some time, has have had a contradiction in the social relations, the relations of production, and the forces of production. I think the forces of production, as they're evolving now, for example, um, 
I'm thinking about driverless cars and how people are saying, oh, that's going to throw so many people off um, out of work um, if we if we have these. And that that's just a, a perfect example of the forces of production developing. And I think what we have to do is um, is say, no, we're not going to create vast numbers of, of people who are, uh, you know, disenfranchised from uh, the, the economy and have no place in the economy. We need to have, for instance, socialized medicine to make sure that um, a, a person who's lost his or her job is not going to um, to be uh, bankrupt from medical uh, bills, for example, if they are facing uh, an illness. So, um, so I do think that uh, although we have to wait, and or there's um, there's a feeling in the vast um, stretch of history that you have to wait for the forces of production and the relations of production to be in contradiction with each other for things to move forward. Um, I think we can um, we can say that uh, we can move that along or we can make that uh, clearer, we can clarify those contradictions. And I think that's one thing that our party is doing and I hope you're I hope you're right about Israel there. Um, I'm not I'm not sure um, from Ohio it's it's hard to tell, but um, I hope you're right. Thank you. Norma, your mic is open. Norma. Hi, thank you for all this. A while back you said something that I think you didn't mean exactly, but I'll give you a chance to expand on it if you want to. Okay. Uh, talking about uh, possibility of socialism coming to the United States, um, and you said maybe there would be a turnaround and um, I, I think that people are out there marching in huge numbers where they weren't or gathering. Uh, DSA has expanded to the point where they're challenged to accommodate the numbers, for example, mm -hmm. and other places as well, the, the women's movement activity, so forth. Uh, but I think that it's not being encouraged with uh, analysis. The placards, I say, needs need at least the placards need to say where we're going. I don't mind if they say end the profit or some serious uh, policies to share among people so that they grow beyond repeating all this over and over, which I'm sure you you think goes on. We all do know that people struggle and then we're back to the same place again. So, for example. Electing Democrats is not going to get us what we want. Electing Greens basically won't get us what we want in the, because we're still in the capitalist structure and the Greens advocate for entrepreneurship, you know, which is capitalism. Um, among all of those struggles, there needs to be the idea somehow that we live with age segregation. We separate our two-year-olds from the parents uh, by force of the state when they're 72 months old. They have to go into an institution which orients them in the direction of serving our owning class. And it keeps that up for a lifetime. Uh, people spend time like recovering Catholics. People spend life recovering from schooling. We don't need schooling as at presently constructed at all. Uh, we don't need the eight-hour day. We need people doing things that are relevant for society. And now this is where idea comes in. I think if people had the opportunity to think of another way of living together, you know, 90-year-olds are not excluded because they're 90, but people, uh, according to their ability, uh, participate in production. Everybody wants to participate in production. So we permit that by changing the way, the structures in which we live. And uh, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do that by installing Democrats again. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you for that comment, Norm. I really, I agree with you that um, I think electing Democrats and Greens is not going to help um, uh, move us towards uh, socialism either. It might 
ease the pain of some groups of people um, in the process. But um, but and and I guess I, I you're right. I didn't really mean that um, maybe things would would change. Um, I think I think we got to a point. Um, for example, what I was thinking of with Obamacare, um, people were so frustrated with their um, their premiums going up. I, I, I think people, if they had the chance, they would say, yes, we want just Medicare for everyone and have a public option. I think people would be much more in favor of a public option uh, right now. But of course, the the um, I know realistically the uh, the uh, powers that um, be, uh, the powers that were elected uh, and re-elected in November, are not going to allow that to happen. So I think, I think our only hope that way is to continue to educate people. And educate is the word. To you're right. Think of it how another way, another world is possible. Another way of living is possible. Maybe, maybe by demonstrating that um, people live. Um, a, much more comfortably in other um, parts of the world where uh, where some of those uh, human needs are taken care of in a socialized way. But thank, thanks for your comments. Gary, your mic is open. Gary Bono, your mic is open. Okay, hello? Hello? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, what I wanted to say was this, like someone, you know, asked the question about, you know, the analysis of, um, well, you know, how else do you put it, fascism in our, our current situation. And I'd like to point out, you know, just like to point that International Publishers has right now available from stock the essay or the, um, the address made by George Dimitrov in the 30s about fascism. And, you know, the title is um, Against Fascism and War. And this was made in the 30s, but, you know, so it, 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 it's not specifically relevant, but in general it's relevant. And I think that it's very important that people understand this. I mean, also Palmieri Togliatti made you know certain lectures on this in the 30s and we're going to be bringing out that shortly you know international publishers right. but right now i think that's important that people who want to understand this you mm -hmm. know get that book by the Beatruff, which is you know basically the analysis of what to do and you know what's happening now and what to do and and this this kind of thing no, so, you know, that, that, that's all I have to say. Great. Thank you, Gary. I think we should, uh, you know, maybe there will be a, uh, a webinar on, on Dimitrov. I hope so. Uh, but that, you're right, it's a very worthwhile uh, text to be reading right now. So um, I hope people take your advice. Thanks. It looks like our last question is from... Diane Franks, your mic is open. Diane, I don't. Um, I don't think I put a question in. <clears throat> okay. Well, that's. I think that. Yeah. Sometimes I think it. It. I don't know why it does that, but that's fine. Okay. So no more questions. D. Not that I can see. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody who who joined in. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I will make the uh, PowerPoint slides. I'll send those to D. So um, if anybody um, wants to look at those further or wants to look at the bibliography, um, and also you can always um, find me somewhere um, on the internet. So. I'm easily located. Thank you very much for uh, for for listening. Thank you, Anita. Okay. Good night, Thanks. everyone. Good night. Bye bye. You can put up the last slide so it's in the it's in the. Uh... Uh, can you see it? No.
Yeah, here we go. Okay. All right. So yeah. now it'll be in the in the uh, recording. Oh, right. Okay, that's good. So I don't have to send you the PowerPoint separately. Well, you can. Some people ask for them independently. You can. Okay. Okay. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.